All right, class, the train is moving to the next station, chapter 14, bonds payable. And we will now begin to use time value money that I introduced uh, as a refresher from chapter, in chapter six uh, in our first lecture. Uh, so now we're gonna look at some present value of future uh, payments, obligations of the corporation uh, you know, to, uh, for long-term debt. So let's, get, let's talk about this. So companies have basically two uh, forms of financing, equity, where we uh, sell stock in the company and uh, investors have an ownership interest in the company. They have a right to all future earnings. Uh, that's really cool if you're an investor. We like to say they have skin in the game uh, because if the company does it well, they can lose everything, but they can uh, make a lot of money if the company does well. Second form of financing are, uh, is debt. And so uh, investors in debt, they don't have skin in the game where they can have big upside if the company does well. Does well. The company only has to pay back uh, the uh, obligation uh, from the contract that they have with the debt investor. We'll look at this in bonds uh, here in a minute. So if the company does extremely well, uh, they just got to pay back what uh, they, they owe that uh, debt investor, nothing else. And so there's no upside win. Now, if the company uh, goes bankrupt, does very uh, poorly, the bond investor is first in line. They can come in and claim uh, all the assets of the company and turn those into cash. And if that, does, if that uh, doesn't fulfill the entire bond obligation, then the common stockholders uh, the equity holders get zero, right? And so uh, in a bankruptcy situation, you have a credit committee uh, with the bondholders there looking at the assets of the company and will try to take over and will take over the company. And so uh, the present value of a bond, we're gonna look at this present value, the future payments we've gotta make on that, that bond. So bonds, unlike notes payable, uh, two differences from notes payable, one, uh, uh, the interest is going to, some part of the interest is going to be paid along the way, whatever the stated interest rate, we'll see that in a minute, and then the liability will be paid at the end. And it's a much longer term. Notes payable anywhere from a couple of months to two years, not much more than that. A bond could be a 10, 20, 30 year bond. Municipalities, cities, they, uh, that's how they fund themselves with bond offerings. The federal government funds uh, trillions and trillions of dollars with uh, treasury notes and they have uh, common factors. They have three, five, seven, 10 year treasuries and 30 year treasuries, uh, nothing beyond that these days. Although I think the UK, uh, United Kingdom has a 100 year bond. It's a much uh, longer term that we've got to uh, take into account here. Uh, and so we have some new definitions for you and you may remember some of this uh, from uh, principles of accounting. And so uh, that bond is gonna have a face amount. That's, that face amount equals the payment that we made by the company on the maturity date, the last date of that bond. If it's a 10 year bond, on the last day of the 10th year, the face amount of that bond will be paid. If that bond says $1,000 bond, $1,000 will be paid on the very last day of the term of that bond. Now, here's where it gets interesting. Got a lot of terms for that face amount also called the principal, the par value, the stated amount, maturity value. And in class, by the way, even me, I use these interchangeably. Sometimes I'll call it the principal, sometimes I'll call it the maturity value, uh, I like uh, stated amount, or the face amount. I, I will, myself personally, use even different terms for that. Now, during the term of the bond, interest is gonna be paid. Uh, it's a periodic, interest payment that's going to be paid and how much is going to be paid exactly what is stated on the bond certificate if it's a five percent bond for the life of that bond the company will pay five percent of what five percent of the face value or the principal uh whatever that amount is and then it'll be a stated right right on the bond certificate okay here you go more terms than just the uh you got stated rate coupon rate nominal rate. So there's different terms for uh, exactly the same thing. And unfortunately, 
I use these kind of interchangeably. I like coupon rate. I use coupon rate a lot because uh, that's what I think is, you know, finance people use more. But it could be, I'll sometimes use a stated rate or nominal rate. So you're going to have to know all these terms interchangeably. And so they're different kind of bonds. Um, and um, one is debenture bonds, meaning uh, they're not backed up by any kind of asset. They're just by the full faith and credit of the corporation. And so you'll see uh, a lot of bonds uh, like this. And so it just totally depends on the uh, success of the corporation to pay uh, that uh, debenture bond. Uh, mortgage bonds, they're going to be backed by an asset, uh, some type of real estate. So if you don't, if, you, if the company doesn't pay back that bond, then the creditor owns that real estate. And so they have a, so this a mortgage bond, or we all call it asset backed securities, will have a lower interest rate because there's a specific asset they could come in and claim that gets them uh, near the front of the line for these things. Convertible bonds, we'll look at these when we get into earnings per share calculations, but they can be converted into shares of stock. So here's a place where kind of in the middle between equity and debt. Yes, I have debt. I know I'm going to be paid back my face amount at the end of life, but if the company does really well, hey, I could just go convert that into shares of stock. So uh, you can win both ways with this and convertible bonds. Why would companies ever issue a bond that could be converted into stock? Well, one reason, they want lower interest rates. In today's world, interest rates have been so low, you don't see a lot of convertible bonds out there. But it's a way to get a lower interest rate, but you're giving up uh, dilution in ownership that more shares could be issued uh, out of your control because they'll be uh, convertible at the uh, discretion of the uh, bondholders. Uh, callable bonds, uh, that's when the uh, creditor can, can call, uh, uh, the, the, not the credit, the issuing company, they can call these bonds. If they say, hey, I'm paying really high interest rates, and let's say usually they'll be callable after the third year or something, or fourth year, they'll be, be uh, expressively stated on the bond. But if there's lower interest rates in the market, and I'm paying a really high interest rate on a certain set of bonds, hey, I'm gonna call all those bonds in, reissue new ones at a lower interest rate. And so as an investor, more you want to be looking at hey are these bonds callable uh, because I might not get my the interest rate the stated interest rate the coupon rate uh, forever until the life of the bond if they're callable so uh, you have to uh, consider that and then um, uh, serial bonds are just a series of similar you know different terms you know one bond offering may have five or six so some are doing five years some are doing six years some are doing seven years and so uh, you, you see uh, some of that. Well, here you go. This is the kind of, this slide is the core of this chapter. Students really do get confused about this. And I, I can't help you. You have to read the text, listen to my lecture. Not enough. You have to get in the text. You have to kind of internalize this. But there are, and I think you're confused because there are two rates. One is, I call it the promise rate, it's the stated rate, it's the coupon rate. It's the rate, interest rate on that bond. That's what the company promises to pay in interest for the life of that bond. Well, that may or may not be, most likely will not be what the market rate is because the market rates are changing daily. And so when we create this paper with the stated interest rate, before we go out and sell this bond, hey, rates have changed. And so there's going to be a market rate. In other words, if you are paying less in the stated rate than what investors want the market rate, well, guess what? If you didn't change something, nobody's buying that bond. You'll never sell that bond because they can go to a different company and get the market rate. And so we're going to have to make some adjustments uh, because of the stated rate of that bond being different than the market rate. Now, if for some a crazy reason the stated rate and the market rate is uh, the, exactly the same, then we'll receive the full face amount of that bond. However, if we're paying uh, less than, uh, in this case, the stated rate is 12%, the market rate, what the market demands is 14%, so we're only going to pay in the future 10 years, 20-year bond. We're going to pay 12%, the market's expecting 14%, 
Well, we're never gonna get the full amount of that face value of that bond day one. We're going to get less. And if we're not willing to take less, not gonna happen unless you wanted to pay 14%. But we've already created all the bond paperwork and everything to do a 12% bond. So therefore, we're gonna receive less cash up front, less than the face amount. How much less? Guess what? Time value of money. We're gonna calculate how much they should get so that bond will equal a 14% bond. And we'll look at that. Now, if you're paying more, the standard rate is 12%, but the market rate's only 10%, you're paying more for the life of that bond. You're paying 12%. The market only needed 10%. Guess what? You're going to get more than the cash value up front. And so in that case, uh, it's sold at a premium. So in this case, when you pay out less interest, your bond's going to sell at a discount. Makes sense. Like a discounted clothing or whatever. Discount. And if you get more cash to the face value up front, because you're paying more interest, you're going to get more. Uh, one thing I like about that, easy to me, it's easy to remember because it's a direct relationship. You pay more in interest, you get more. You pay less than the market rate, you get less up front. Now, where does the market rate come from? It all gets back to the risk. Various corporations have uh, varying degrees of risk, and we generally look at U.S. government bonds as being kind of a risk-free interest rate. I don't know with our national debt now if that's completely true, but that's considered a risk-free interest rate. And we look at a spread from that uh, going out to corporate bonds, which is what we are focused on in this chapter. And so these are rated. There's two companies, S&P and Moody's, who rate companies. So the highest investment grade, AAA, uh, that would be the U.S. government uh, there. Uh, I think at one point Johnson & Johnson was rated as AAA. They, because of all the uh, contingent liabilities they've had around um, uh, uh, talcum powder and issues with that being cancer producing, and also I think opiates, they had some big litigation. I wonder if they're still AAA. I, I don't know the answer to that. But uh, you get down to some company, anything triple B and above for S&P or BAA for Moody's, we call that investment grade. And that matters, I think, uh, while I was at Lennox, we moved up from uh, double B to triple B on both sides. We moved up to investment grade bond. That was really good for us because uh, then pension, a lot of pensions who invest in bonds, they are not allowed to invest in anything lower than investment grade. So that becomes kind of a line uh, for some pension plans to make sure they're not taking too much risk for their uh, beneficiaries of the, of the uh, pension. And so you get way down in here. These are called junk bonds. You may have heard of that. It means more speculative, you know, that these are highly risky. They, you may never uh, see the, receive the face value again. And so those, the market rate, uh, interest rate for those bonds is going to be higher than the market rate for AAA. The AAA rated bonds are going to be closer to a U.S. Treasury amount. And companies with high risk, they're going to have to pay a lot more. We call that... Uh, the spread and in interest rates. I'm sure you'll talk about that in your, in your financing class. And so how do we calculate the bond price? You know, and we're going to look at a discount example first where we're going to pay less than the market rate. So um, what the stated rate, what the coupon rate tells us is one thing. How much cash we're going to pay in the future and is it how many times per year is going to be paid. Corporate bonds mostly twice a year, semi-annual payments. And a lot of our examples would be like that. And so we're gonna discount back those interest payments and we're gonna discount back that face value at what, we're gonna discount it back at the market rate. So the stated rate tells us how much future cash payments will be outgoing and the timing of those cash payments, what is that called? Annuity. And this is gonna be a present value of an ordinary annuity because the payments are made at the end of the period and we're accruing interest along the way. So not an annuity due, an ordinary annuity. So this would be the present value of an ordinary annuity. And in here, it's just the present value of a future value. And for that's that payment that we made, the face value is paid on the last day of the term of that bond. So a 10-year bond we paid uh, in 
it would be equal to n 10 times how many payments per year, uh, even though there's no payments, and we would look at that as a present value of that one payment uh, 10 years later. Here, it would be the present value of an annuity of interest payments. And so we take that present value, uh, and that's what determines the fair value, the market value of that bond. And that, that present value is going to be less than the face value if the stated rate is paying less than uh, the market rate. And we'll look at some real examples. We'll do a lot of problems in class on this too. Here's an example. Oh, by the way, don't forget from principles, 98 means the bond is selling at 98% of what? Face value, 98% of the face value. And in finance, uh, they like to just use uh, something simple there. So they compare companies and say, hey, those bonds are selling at 98. You're selling at 102, which would be a premium. So if the bonds are selling at 100.0, that means they're selling at the face value for those bonds. Bonds selling at less than 100.0, 99, 98, 97, their bonds are selling at a discount, meaning company's stated rate is less than the market rate. If the market price of the bond is greater than 100.0, 101, 102, 103, that means companies paying more interest uh, in their stated rate, in their coupon rate, than the market rate or the effective rate. It's another term for market rate. So now, uh, here we go. Here's an actual calculation. And so uh, uh, Masterware uh, sold uh, $700,000 of bonds, 12% bonds, meaning that is the coupon rate, is 12% coupon rate, coupon rate, stated rate uh, on those, on the interest and the face value, the principal, the par value is 700,000 there. And so the bonds mature in three years. And guess what? That's not the market yield. The market yield the, is, ex, the market is expecting 14%. This company is more risky than a 12% company. And if you don't um, let them earn 14% on your bonds, they will not buy it. And so you're out, you're out of luck. Guess what? You need $700,000 because we're trying to fund an activity in our business, maybe grow the business. Maybe if you're a restaurant chain, add some more restaurants. The company needs that $700,000. And so it's going to uh, sell these bonds at an amount that will yield an effective rate and market rate of 14%. So how do we calculate that? Uh, we take uh, 42,000 in payments, and these are annual payments, Interest of 42,000 is payable, oh no, these are semi-annual payments, uh, sorry about that, uh, June 30th and December 31st. So uh, here's an ordinary annuity of $1, N equals six, because three years times two payments a year, N equals six, I equals 7% because 14% uh, market rate divided by two, because there's two uh, compounding periods in the year, two payments per year. And so, N equals six, I equals 7%. What's my present value? 200,195. Future value is equal to zero. I'm just looking for present. So I know uh, I'm trying to determine the present value. I know N, I know I, I can get to that present value of 42,000. And then next, we're also gonna have another cash outflow because we are gonna pay $700,000, the face value on the last day of the third year. That's the maturity value. Regardless of what we receive up front, we have a contract that we're gonna pay $700,000 in, in the end of three years. What's the present value of that? N equals six, I equals 7%. No PMT, no payments. And so that's equal uh, $700,000 uh, at a 14% interest. That's why it's a high interest, 466. That's a lot lower than 700,000. What is the difference between 466 and 700? Interest. The difference between a present value and a future value is interest. Um, and so that uh, difference is interest, 466. So guess what? Um, my present value of six payments of 42,000 and one payment of 700,000 at the end of three years, that present value is 666. At what interest rate? 14%, the market rate. So therefore, the company is going to receive cash of 666000 
They're going to pay 700000 at the very last day of th the third year, and they're going to pay six payments of 42000 And guess what? That is now a 14% uh, interest rate. And so the investor is going to uh, receive 14% interest. The company is going to have an expense of 14% uh, because they only receive 666 up front, not 700000 so we've taken a 12% bond and we've made it a 14% bond. Now, a couple of terms uh, here for the market rate, the 14%. Market rate, that's one term. Effective rate, and then yield. Uh, yield is a very common term. This bond is now yielding 14%. However, it's only paying 12%. And so the investor is yielding, receiving 14% interest, um, and the company is incurring 14% interest. Now, let's look at the accounting for this. Uh, well, here, here's a, a, a little graphic that talks about everything I just talked about. Uh, six payments of 42,000, one payment of 700,000, uh, present value of all of that, 666, uh, 633. And so here is uh, the accounting uh, for this. Uh, and you'll have to know all these kind of uh, journal entries, except this. We are not going to look at investments because that's chapter 12. Uh, so do not worry about the investor side of this in blue here. We're only going to talk about the issuer side, the companies. Companies can invest in bonds of other companies. And we cover that in chapter 12 towards the end of the class. And, uh, Forget that, <laughs> sorry, to, I can't take it off the slide, I'm using this slide. And so here's the entry we care about. We're gonna credit in the bond payable account, the face value. The only thing that ever goes to the bond payable account, the face value, 700,000. And we're gonna debit cash for 666, 633, because that's how much cash we're gonna receive. And we credit that, and we create this new account, discount on bonds payable. That's the difference, 33,000. Now, what are we gonna do with that 33,000? We're gonna amortize it over the three years. And you might remember this from principles where we made it easy. We just took and divided it by six and did what's called the straight line method because why do we do it that way? Well, number one, it was principles of accounting. It's uh, elementary school. You guys are in <laughs> true college now and by the way, the straight line method not allowed by generally accepted accounting principles. You have to use the effective interest method. And so that, again, kind of the core uh, uh, learnings from this chapter is how to do the effective interest method amortization, because we're gonna have to go record interest expense now. And by the way, interest expense is not gonna be 12%. Interest expense is gonna be 14% a year. Because this bond, we only got 666 up front, and we got to pay 700 later. Therefore, that 33,000 is what is the catch-up, if you will, for the company and the investor to take it from a 12% bond to a 14%, 14% bond. So that 33,000 is really uh, related to that 2% difference. Because we're going to pay 12, but the investor has to earn 14. So that 33,000 is truing up, making the investor whole at a 14%, at the market rate. Otherwise, we could never sell this bond. If we try to get 700,000 for the bond here, not gonna happen, not gonna happen. We can only sell it for 666. Why? We're paying 12% uh, and the market rate is 14%. And uh, if you're confused by this, I'd really ask you to spend time on this Think about it. Get internalize the logic. Read the chapter. Now you got to read it several times. You got to internalize the logic because the multiple choice on our exams are going to are going to uh, burn you if you don't understand the logic, right? And that's how accounting works. So, first thing we're going to do here is we're going to record interest expense at what the true interest expense is, and the true interest expense is fourteen percent. So at any point in time, we're going to take the carrying value. Carrying value is the outstanding balance. 
is just going to be the bond payable account minus the discount, whatever's in the discount. Originally, day one, that's 666, right? And so uh, we're going to take that and calculate what is the effective interest expense. And we're doing this after six months, right? These are paid uh, semi-annually. And so the interest rates will be 14% divided by two, 7% times 666. That's our interest expense. So step one, we're gonna calculate the interest expense. Step two, how much cash do we pay? Well, we know that, because that's gonna be the stated rate, in this case, stated rate divided by two, times the face value. Let's look at that probably on the next slide, uh, right here. We're gonna pay 42,000. We just calculated interest expense, and the difference is the reduction in the uh, bond discount amount. And so, if you will, this is going to be a plot. By the way, it will go down uh, to zero mathematically at the end because of the manner in which we calculated the uh, 666 uh, using the time value of money. And this kind of will prove it out. And here it goes right here. You can see, uh, again, back in principles, we had a straight line uh, amortization of bond, the bond discount account, not here. We were going to start with the effective interest method and the difference. We are only paying $42,000. You can see here, even in the last payment, $42,000 payment, uh, interest expense $48,544, and the uh, plug $6,544, and guess what? We take it all the way down and we record the full, we are going, we started with a debit in that account of $33,367, and we're gonna put credits, six credits in there, uh, that total to 33,367, and we're gonna um, uh, take that balance in that, amortize all the way to zero, as, as you would expect, common sense and accounting. And for each one of these, we will, and we'll see, we'll work problems, we'll work a lot of problems with it. The debit, debit interest expense, credit cash, credit the bond discount account. So that's the journal entries, and you'll have to know these journal entries back and forth. Now, finally, there's a, no, not finally, because we got a couple of other topics here. Uh, zero coupon bonds, they, they pay no interest. And um, I think there's some treasuries, there's some companies that, hey, you can buy a bond, we're not gonna pay you any interest along the way. Well, guess what? It's, uh, it's the same answer uh, uh, as before, except we just don't have a cash payment, but we're gonna use a market rate, and we're gonna discount that that thing all the way down, and that will be the whole value. If, let's just go back over here. Um, if there was no payments, this 700,000 zero coupons, it would have sold for 466 because there were no payments along the way. It's just gonna be a deeply discounted bond with a very large um, bond discount amount, and we will amortize that. Everything else stays the same. It just ends up, um, uh, it was zero. The payment is zero, everything else, all the math would work uh, with the same steps, same math as, as before. Now, if bonds sell for more than their face value, <coughs> excuse me, um, they're gonna sell at a premium. And so the company is gonna receive uh, more cash. And say so we do the same math, everything is, is exactly the same. All the steps in the math is exactly the same. We just talked about it at the discount. It's just that the company's gonna receive more cash up front and we're gonna create a bond premium account with a credit balance, in this case, 35,533, and then everything else stays the same. And so uh, here, forget the investor again, X that. Uh, so 735, bonds payable, guess what? We never put anything in the bonds payable account except the face value. The cash we receive, uh, that's calculated, using um, the, the market rate, same as it under the discount situation. It just turns out the answer is 735. And instead of a bond, uh, uh, a credit and a bond discount account, we create a new type of account called a bond premium account with a credit. And then we just follow the same math, calculate the interest. So look how this works here. Uh, we're paying more than the interest expense and that results. So we start out with a credit and the premium account and these are debits all the way down until we uh, amortize that credit balance down to zero. Everything's exactly the same kind of math, same steps, and everything else. It's just you're dealing with a premium 
uh, versus a discount. Why is it a premium? Because we are paying more interest than the market rate. We still discount uh, and we cal calculate our present value using the market rate, just happens to be a, uh, a lower rate than what we're paying. Again, just to kind of summarize here, and then just go back and say that one more time. Uh, step one, we're gonna calculate the present value. How do we calculate it? We use the market rate of the future payments. What do we use the stated rate for? Because people get confused on this. The stated rate is nothing more than calculating the payments, future payments. The market rate is calculating the present value. The price of the bond is determined by the market, the present value of those future payments, which come from the stated rate. I will have a summary sheet on here uh, that we'll, we'll go over in, in one of the next lectures. All right, uh, we're getting close to the end of at least the lecture part of this. It'll work problems. This is, uh, you'll just be tested on this backwards and forward, both in exam one and also in the final exam. So you're, you're gonna just really internalize this, figure out the logic, don't memorize stuff, figure out the logic, understand it uh, backwards and forwards, spend time on this on your own, reading the text, working problems uh, until you really internalize this and understand it. So uh, when we sell bonds, we are going to have costs, a lot of costs. And um, I think at Linux, we sold $400 million of bonds and um, in one of my, uh, while I was there, and I want to say the is debt issue cost was uh, two or three million. It, lawyers are going to be involved. Uh, your auditors will be involved. Uh, there'll be a, a lot of people who put effort into this. I mean, the document for a debt offering memorandum uh, could be 75, 100 pages, uh, especially for a, pub a public bond offering. And so um, almost like a 10K, you're going to, you're going to, uh, fully disclose the risk of this bond. You're going to talk about where and how you're going to use this money. What's uh, what's this money used for? You have enough information in that 100 page. You have a lot of financials in there. You have enough information. So the investors, these are usually institutional, very smart investors. They'll read this. They'll understand this. And um, uh, in these 100 pages, they will make decisions of whether they're going to buy your bond or not. And so uh, lawyers are involved in this. So the, the cost a lot of costs, and then um, uh, there will be an underwriting fee. There's people who help sell these bonds for you, the bankers, and so investment banks are a big there in, in that regard. So there's gonna be two or three million, and so what we're not gonna do is debit expense for this amount. We're just going to net these debt issuance costs in with the bond discount, or you know, and increase the bond discount, because these are gonna be debits, or reduce the bond premium amount, and then just follow the amortization here. So they get netted in and factored in for the life of uh, the bond. And so we combine, as I just said, with the discount of the premium, and then that just becomes part of the uh, entire uh, amortization uh, factor for that. Uh, I'm gonna, uh, stop there, and this will be an, another section of the uh, next lecture.